Okay, so for the next session, we're doing a panel on mobile devices and beyond. We've got a lot of fun people to uh, be here with us on, on this topic. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to have a quick round of introductions where each panel member is going to spend a minute say, saying who they are um, and uh, then talk a little bit about you know, their main point they want to make about what the future of mobile devices is going to be. And that's going to be about three minutes each. And then we're going to go to a set of prepared questions uh, that I've had and the panel members have already talked about briefly. But then we're going to open it up to the folks in the audience. And when we get to that point, um, I will have you all stand up and come to the microphone and say who you are and your affiliation, and then address the question to a particular panel member uh, that the other panel, panel members will probably jump in if they have something to say about that particular topic. OK, I should introduce myself first. My name is Thad Starner. I'm a professor here at Georgia Tech. Um, I've been doing wearable computing, making wearable computers for about 20 years. And right now, I'm uh, one of the technical leads on Google's Project Glass, which is what I'm wearing today. So next, um, I should uh, introduce John Avery, who's a group manager for Panasonic, um, the Panasonic Innovation Center. So if you would like to say a bit about yourself and Thank you. your point. Yeah, Panasonic, uh, uh, the Innovation Center that just opened, uh, it's actually right across the corner at the Synergy One building. Um, it's part of the automotive division. Panasonic is in a lot of businesses, but this is part of the automotive division. So it's all about bringing uh, mostly infotainment systems to a vehicle. And I'm glad that uh, the vehicle aspect can be represented on this kind of panel. I think it's a very unique system, has some uh, difficult constraints. It's why I came back from consumer into automotive. I think these are some interesting technical problems to, to think about and focus on. Okay. So next we have Chris Penrose, who, oh, sorry, let me try that again, doing alphabetical here. Uh, we have Blair McIntyre, who is a professor here at Georgia Tech and runs the Augmented Environments Lab. Thanks, Matt. So I'm, uh, I've been doing augmented reality research for about 20 years. I've been a professor here for about 13. And most of my work over the years has been focused on how uh, or an understanding how to create effective, compelling, uh, entertaining augmented reality, mixed reality experiences, uh, both by working with folks myself, so designers, uh, uh, artists, uh, to create these experiences, evaluate them, understand them, and also by building tools and, and technologies to let uh, artists, designers, those sorts of folks uh, work with the technology themselves. And to his right, we have Chris Penrose, now I'll get it right, uh, who's the Senior Vice President of Emerging Devices from AT&T. Well, good morning. It's good to be with all of you today. Um, I have, my job is at AT&T is really to really connect everything up that uh, we can to our wireless network. And, and so uh, we really kind of look at the, the world pretty, pretty simply that if it's, if it's connected, it's smart. If it's not connected, it's dumb. And our goal is to connect everything up as, uh, as much as possible. And so I, I really handle everything at AT&T with regards to anything other than a smartphone. So uh, all the tablets, PCs, uh, any type of consumer electronics, uh, automotive. Uh, so, uh, so really kind of across everything you know, that uh, you could connect up is going to kind of fall within my purview uh, at AT&T. And so some of the things I'm really excited about, I think, as we go forward, you know, is the fact that uh, you know, the, the capabilities of, of connectivity uh, are, are really being realized by people to see that you know, these things really can make my world better. And, and so, and at the end of the day, we try to do everything from the, from the eye of the consumer. What, what does a consumer really want to do with this connectivity uh, is really key. And so, you know, in, the, in the space of, of the automobile, for instance, I mean, we're obviously working very closely to not only bring the capabilities that you could have on a smartphone, you know, into the car, but also the ability to have that car connect, you know, you know through uh, to the infrastructure and, you know, and the environment and to other cars. And so, but do all that very safely, because at the end of the day, uh, if you, you can have all this connectivity, but it's got to be safe and it's got to, it's got to work well. Uh, and you know, and on a recent trip, uh, you know, over to Asia, it's, it's some of the other exciting things are really about how the form of, of being able to connect, you know, is, is changing. And these, uh, you know, these interesting um, form factors of, of having glass that is uh, that is truly uh, bendable and pliable, and how you can actually now, you know, take these new form factors and really fit your technology into it. I think you know opens up a whole world of, of, of things to connect up that we've never seen before. So very excited to be with you guys today, and we'll look forward to the conversation. Okay, so next uh, to him is Bruce Thomas, who is director of the Wearable Computing Laboratory at the University of South Australia. Um, I've been researching wearable computing and augmented reality for the past 15 years. Um, we, 
what not, as Thad did, we had to build our own wearable computers from in the good old days. Um, uh, the two areas that I'm most interested in is uh, how do we apply these technologies so people every day can use them, and uh, user interface technology, so that's, so that's the science that we do. Uh, before that, I had 10 years of researching uh, user interfaces. Okay. And next we have Jay Wright, who is the Vice President of Business Development at Qualcomm. Good morning. You, you know, it's really unfair that you get to have your notes <laughs> inside your Google Glass and we don't have any assistive power. When a, when a gentleman can't win, he changes the game. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So my name is Jay Wright. I've been in um, mobile for, I think, 19 years now. I'm actually a software engin engineer underneath my business exterior. Um, I spent a lot of time doing startups, executing on really good ideas. I'd say being successful executing on really good ideas before their time, which is another way of describing failure, um, <laughs> at least in the startup context, context. So I've been at Qualcomm for about five years now. Um, my primary responsibility has been commercialization of new technologies, primarily non-radio technologies and R&D. And that's encompassed computer vision and a lot of what we call sixth sense technologies, context awareness kind of technologies, so low-level audio so we can be listening all the time, using sensors to determine what the device is doing. And one of the things that's grown very quickly in our R&D efforts has been augmented reality and computer vision. So we launched a, a software platform called Euphoria that's for app developers that essentially lets apps and devices see and that's grown very quickly. So I'm now moving on to lead that product and, uh, and business for Qualcomm. Okay. Let me start with sort of the first obvious question. So we've been seeing a lot of new devices either announced or actually you know, being for sale, including things like uh, Bluetooth connected wristwatches or you know, fitness monitors, you know, things you put on your wrist or you know, in your pocket or in your shoe, or, or even you know, things like Google Glass, which I'm wearing here. Um, so I want to ask each of you in turn, what is um, the form factor that you're really excited about? I mean, obviously, there's going to be some bias here. Um, but what are the form factors you're most excited about? And you know, beyond that, which ones do you think are going to become common in the future? So let's hmm. start at the beginning again. OK. I guess uh, thinking about how far into the future, I'm trying to imagine for me about 10 years in the future, I'll be 60. And all I can say is I hope they have really big characters or I'm going to need an arm extender or something. <laughs> I won't be able to see. Uh, but really, I think accessibility features, things that uh, help us see and hear better, are going to become more important. Uh, I think there's going to be a further decomposition of specific functionality. I think uh, purpose-built devices for certain specific uses right now, I think most of the smartphones are designed to solve all the problems at the same time. And uh, having devices that are built for a specific purpose are going to become more common. So, so more of an appliance-based thing where you... Um, uh... Well, for the decomposition part, for example, the battery, the connectivity, it's always in every device. And mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if, if I had my belt as the battery, mm -hmm. with my belt line, I could go a month at that point. Um, you could have uh, all of your devices sharing that source. And then, for example, on your cell phone, maybe there's a a display that unrolls from a pen format or whatever, but it doesn't need to have a big battery or connectivity because it's being shared by something else mm -hmm. that's available to you. Um, I do think things like the wristwatch, things that, that bring out the functionality from the places to the places where you need it, mm -hmm. the places where it's, they can share as a kind of a hive all the functionality and do things more uh, uniquely that way. Cool. Okay. Um, how about things like, uh, one of the things we haven't talked about is automotive. Do you see yeah, I mean, that's what I said. Uh, I've been a consumer for a while, and I think I uh, was very intrigued by the automotive space and what's happening there. Um, there's fertile ground here. Um, and it's mostly about not bringing more distraction. It's, it's the, the hard part, the interesting part, the thing that I think, I, uh, I think needs to be focused on more is how to remove the distractions and make driving safer. Mm -hmm. It's actually, uh, we have five cars in my family. We've got three college-age kids. And, my wife and I, and we've had three cars total in the last two years. Uh, we're all fine, everybody's fine, but it, I'm personally, it's, a, it's like a mission now. I mean, it just, it seems almost like an indictment to us as engineers that we allow for that situation to still exist today. I mean, this is a solvable problem. Yeah. In a controlled highway like we have in downtown Atlanta, I drive 100 miles every day. And, um, oh, I thought you were going to say 100 miles an hour. No, <laughs> no. 
100 miles in and out. I mean, it's a 50-mile commute each way for me every day, in and out of Atlanta. Um, see accidents all the time. And uh, it just, it feels like there's a technical solution for those, most of those cases that, that you see in a controlled environment. Now, you may not be able to solve it for all the roads all over the country and all the situations that might come up. But for a controlled situation like in a highway in a main thoroughfare in downtown Atlanta, it feels like there's technical solutions there that, that should be brought to bear through connectivity, low, low uh, latency, device to device connectivity, through cloud assist, through all kinds of additional things, alertness features. So I think, I think what you're saying here is that we're going to get, uh, in the future, we're going to see more devices with more specific functionality. Mm -hmm. And some of it's going to be driven by attention and you know, the particular stresses of the mobile, the, the mobile within the environment. The context that you're in. Okay. Blair, what's your thoughts on, the, on you know, where we're going, what sort of form factors are going to be exciting and what we're going to see? So, common. so since I've been doing augmented reality for a long time, where for us it really means putting media out in the world as opposed to on, on individual screens, you know, in the long, long term, I'm, I'm, you know, looking forward to the day when we have real, real AR glasses where we can have media out in the world. In the short term, I think things like Google Glass, uh, the things you mentioned, that you both mentioned, uh, Glass, the watch, the, the, the car, to me they're very exciting as, uh, if they're integrated into sort of your phone ecosystem. So one of the things that, that uh, uh, I liked in Ralph's talk yesterday was um, uh, when he was talking about NFC and talking about how you know, if, you, if you lose your phone, you, you'll notice it within a few minutes as opposed to if you leave a credit card somewhere, you won't you know, notice it for hours. Um, the phone is this thing that's already a personal device for us. We already enter all our now on you know, iOS, we enter all our Twitter, our Facebook, all our media connections. We have everything configured and set up. Um, if we can get to the point where the watch just pairs and it has access to all this, the glass just pairs and it has access to all of this, the opportunities for leveraging these devices because people don't have to, have to configure them, set them up, interact with them directly, uh, explode in my mind, right? The issues of of connectivity and battery are there, it's not as important to me that they share one wireless, but that they share one plan, right? So if I have to pay five bucks more a month to get glass added to my plan, that's kind of a no-brainer if I'm willing to wear it. Um, but if I have to, if I have what, to, are you, saying, are you saying I'm not fashionable here, man? <laughs> no, no, no. If I'm willing to, I mean, it, compared to what I used to wear, seriously. Yes, yes. Well, there is that. No, I mean compared to, so, so you know, different people wear them. You know, we'll go through this this phase where people didn't used to accept Bluetooth headphones, right? And now now they're they're uh, acceptable. So, you know, I think uh, in all our work, we've. Uh, seen different form factors being appropriate for different kinds of experiences. So if I'm walking through Oakland Cemetery and I want to get a tour where ghosts are rising up into the grave and telling me the history of Atlanta, I may need uh, uh, an immersive AR experience. I may be able to do it with audio. Something like glass may not be appropriate for that kind of dramatic experience, but I could get an alternative experience, maybe a more text-based tour, image-based videos um, on that kind of device. And, um, and then, you know, if I have my watch that can alert me to other things and tell me that there is a tour available for something I'm interested in as I'm walking around, I can glance at it and not have to worry about, about, these, uh, about having to always be immersed. So I think um, different form factors that are all connected through some core device are what yeah. excites me. So I, I, think, I think where Blair is going is here, you, you wake up in the morning, you figure out what sort of experience you want, you put on the headphones if you just want music, or you put on your wristwatch if you just want, you know, SMS alerts, or if you're just... Or you have them all on and the technology chooses the right one for the, the, for the, right, for the, job. the right uh, application. Right, right. so you're, you're seeing that a, a whole environment around one network connection yeah. that has one plan and then you hook things in depending on what abilities you yeah, want. Yeah, or it could be separate connections, but from a business viewpoint, managed in a way that, that lets... Con that, doesn't dissuade consumers from engaging with all these devices because of incremental costs. Well, I think we have somebody here to talk about that. So, <laughs> AT&T, what's AT&T's stance on uh, having all these different devices? Well, to yeah, I, I think I'm right in line with these guys and what they said. I mean, obviously, you know, at AT&T, we just launched these new you know, shared data plans that you know, have just come out where you, you can now, and the, the whole idea behind that is to, is to basically give you know, customers a, a big pool of data, uh, which they can then you know, put as many devices off that as they want to share. And so, so the, you know, eliminating that barrier of, of having to pay you know, $30 per, per 
per device that you want to connect up, you know, by having a single bucket of data that you can use is, is one of the one of the first ways that we're you know, working in that space. Um, yeah, I, I would say kind of going along the lines, you know, what we're really seeing too is, is it's just the ability to get the information you want over whatever type of device that you want to use. And so sometimes you actually want bigger formats, you know, and, and sometimes you want smaller formats. And so I, I think to be able to predict, you know, exactly what is going to be, uh, you know, the predominant format out there, you know, it, ironically, you know, we saw the miniaturization of cell phones and now we see everything, <laughs> every cell phone is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you know. So, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it, you continue to kind of see the evolution of, of how people are using the devices is, is so, driving so, a lot. So, so what these two guys are saying, though, is that, you know, the cell phone itself is going to disappear again and then it's going to be you know a tablet or a heads up display or whatever that's actually going to get your 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 information the, and the, the the big phone itself is 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 not the issue anymore i mean what do you think well, about I, that? I think it still plays and you know my, my belief is that phone is still going to be a central part of of your world but I, but I think your ability to actually have uh, the ability to move content between all those uh, devices seamlessly uh, is going to be you know more and more important and, and, and just the ability you know, if, if I'm in if I'm in my home and I'm listening to music I ought to be able to walk you know out the door and I'll be able to continue that same song in the car you know this ability to kind of have seamless content consumption across multiple devices to me you know is is where a lot of this is going obviously you know, so, have, so you, you you see it as a cloud based thing or, I see a or lot being of stored in the phone I, itself I see I see uh, tremendous evolution of cloud based you know services uh, there need to be some storage, you know, on, on devices as well. But I, but I see the ability to get your information wherever, you know, is going to be putting more and more stuff into the cloud to have it accessible through a number of devices. Okay. So, Bruce, you're from a more academic event. Uh, <laughs> where do you see this stuff going? You know, is, there, is there some new form factors, some new interactions that we're going to see coming down the pike? Or um, One of the areas we, we researched for a few years was uh, embedding it in clothing. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, I like the idea of putting it into your belt. Um, you don't throw your lithium-ion battery in the washing machine then. Um, the, the idea here is that, um, uh, interesting thing here, how many people here are actually wearing a watch? That's more than, well, we don't have as many uh, college students. But if you did this in a, in, a, in a freshman class, you would have way less than half the people raise their hand. So it's, our clothing's changing and the technology that we use, the reason I say it is because uh, old farts like me say, well, well, put everything in the watch because you have a watch and it's a big thing and you can do a lot of things with it. But, it's, but I see actually putting it in the clothing because a watch is, is a piece of jewelry. So um, I like the thing at AT&T, the baby monitor. Mm -hmm. cause it, and the reason I think the clothing is, a, is is the spot to put it in is because it's something that you just naturally use. You don't have to interact with the, with it. And there's a lot of challenges with this because you just want to use that. That in the in the baby case, you, you don't want to have to plug your baby in every night. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so you, what you what you want to do is you just want to wash the clothes and put it on the baby, and that's it. And there's, there's, that's just easy. So, so we were looking at embedding technology into into shirts. So one of the things that uh, we were interested in looking at is obesity for kids. So if you just put in a little piece of technology into the back of the shirt, in Australia, uh, most school kids wear uniforms, so you have a set number of shirts that you wear. And you could just say, well, how much do they move around during the day? And so, you know, you're not spying on your kids more than like saying, are you sitting there not doing anything, but did you get enough activity? So I, I see the so integration. You're, you're looking at that for like childhood obesity stuff. Make sure yeah. your kids play enough that they're not yes, scared. Yes, yes. Just but, doing video games, or if they're doing video games, they're doing Dance Dance Revolution or something, it's them moving. Yeah. Right. So, 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 and if you go look at a playground, some kids are really active and others are not. And the parents don't know this, um, short of spying on them. Um, but the idea here is when you're using the clothes, you don't want to plug the shirts in every night. You just want to use these clothes as normal clothes. And so I think, so I see the expansion of the technology into the clothes for. Uh, for health monitoring, for just ease of use, for, uh, you know, so you don't forget your phone. Yeah. You just put on your jacket and the phone's in the jacket. And so, well, also uh, one of the things with the health monitoring thing, but, you know, the whole aging in place stuff that, you know, Beth was pushing on, um, helping people maintain their independence in their home, but still give their adult children some sense uh, that their parents are fine. You know, having stuff in the clothing so that you get some sort of activity level. Um, yes. Uh, from your, you know, your parent, 
um, and you, you know they're fine, and you know, it's not spying on them more than you know, just seeing if motion sensors are going off. You know, I, I can really can see that as you know, something that helps people stay in their, houses, their own homes longer oh, right. and saves a lot of money. I mean, it's, for all facets of your life, there's a, there's, a, there's a niche for this. But, I mean, I, you know, I just really want to get rid of this. And, so, okay, and, we, have, we can on, have a okay, fight. Right. All right, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. Um, no, and, and this, there's nothing wrong with a mobile phone, but it, it's like, this is just such a... a yeah, a brick. It, it's just, it's, it's clunky. I mean, yes, it's designed nicely, and I'm not going to bash Apple. It's, you know, I, um, but it's just, I don't think it's as elegant as, as other solutions. Mm. So we can have, we can have uh, Chris and Bruce go at over the future <laughs> of bricks. Uh, <laughs> okay. So our last uh, uh, speaker, Jay, uh, these new form factors coming by, uh, coming down the pike. What, what excites you, and what do you think is going to become common? So maybe to talk about the near to midterm and then longer term. Yeah. I think near to midterm, the the brick or the rectangular piece of glass in your pocket with a lot of bandwidth and a lot of processing power is not going away anytime soon. Um, it never ceases to ama amaze me when I'm traveling or anywhere, the amount of time and amount of places I pe see people just stopped, glued to their phones. I don't know if they're doing Facebook or Twitter or what, but we have become completely addicted and glued to these things. And the thought that that's going to go away anytime quickly um, is, hard, is hard to believe. What I do think we'll see a lot more proliferation of, and maybe this is when I say midterm, five to eight years, is a lot of other what I'd call slave devices, which are for input or output. Um, we've seen these in all kinds of fields. We see these kinds of, like, kinds of things in the home. This encompasses the sensors I'd see for home yep. automation. This encompasses the kinds of sensors I might see for exercise or health. You guys have seen the things like from Jawbone or Nike where I've got sensors on, on a kind of bracelet. And I'll, I'll probably see those in clothes. It's my personal hope that I can put some kind of sensor in every article of clothing I travel with worth more than $20. So if I get separated to, by a certain distance when I'm leaving my hotel room, <laughs> or I will know because I lose lots of stuff. Um, but I think that's where we're going to see a lot of prolifer proliferation. And there's a lot of work to be done on making all those slave devices work together and connect to the devices and have the right kind of local area or body area or wide area connectivity. So, so you're, re you're really looking at stuff, when you're talking about tagging clothes, yeah. $20 and under, you're really talking about passive RFID without batteries, right? Yeah, yeah in um, that case. I mean, that's what I'm looking for in that use case. It's just let me know when I get you know, a certain distance away from something valuable I, I care about. Yeah, so I, I, think that, I think all the rest of us are talking about these more high-value things, and you're, you're saying there's a lot of value in the really cheap stuff that can be really no, ubiquitous. I, I called that one out because I'm sharing a personal problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there'll be a, a range of different devices, and that's just one of them. But for, I think, what, what it's going to take to completely displace the smartphone, that's going to take some time, and I, I think you're, you're wearing a precursor on your head right now. But I, I don't well, think you. we're going to. I don't think we're going to get completely away or disrupt this brick or rectangular piece of glass in the pocket until we can have a comparable, addictive kind of experience that we're able to interact with and wear it around um, on mm -hmm. our heads. And I think there'll be a huge evolution, probably slow evolution, of things like you're wearing in your head till we actually get there. And mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot of time because there's a lot of technology challenges to make it happen. But I think ultimately that's the disruptive device for the brick. Okay. I could just comment on. Uh, yeah, interesting. We do have something in AT&T Labs. It's called, got, it's called Got My Stuff, and it actually is exactly. I wish I wish we could have had it for you, but but it literally is. Are are these little uh, tags you put on the back of? Uh, you know, you can put it on your tablet, you can put it on your briefcase, you can put it you know you know anywhere. Uh, and you know, when you get more than 30 feet away from it, you know, it's gonna it's actually sends you an alert to say you're you're missing this. Absolutely. Um, and uh, and how does it, it work? Is it like a near field thing or is it near field? And uh, and the other thing is actually what's what now we've actually been playing around with is the absence. Uh, of, uh, of, of of seeing the signal, and so uh, it can actually be the signal can actually be blocked. You know, so we, we actually have 
uh, a cruise ship application being looked at right now where, where people are actually, when they sit down the bar stool because you, you block the near field communication up to the, up to the signal at ceiling, now it knows that that bar stool, that bar stool is actually seated. So, so, the, so the ability to actually see, you know, see that you, know, you're, you don't have something or, or, or blocking that signal to actually cause another action are some, some interesting things where I think the sensor technology is, is just you know, on the cusp of coming out. Well, this, this, uh, I was on a panel myself not too long ago and, and had people ask me about, you know, so what about all these batteries? We're going to create lots of toxic waste. And, you know, I had my own answer for that. But I think kind of a more interesting one, and I'd really talk to the, the industry guys here about this, is, you know, what we're talking about as far as life cycles for these products. You know, we've been seeing things going faster and faster. Is that what we're going to see with these things that we are talking about now? Or, you know, you know how's, how's the life cycle going to really affect say, the business dynamics and the markets going forward, as well as, you know, reuse or recycling of these devices. And we'll start at the other end now so that <laughs> get so, some fairness here. So I guess the life cycle of smartphones has decreased slightly, I think, in the last I several... I think America's is like two years. Every two years, years, they, yeah, they, they get a smartphone. You hear numbers between two years and, and 18 months. Um, and I think it's really the level of innovation that drives the, the replacement. Mm. So, um, yeah, I don't see that changing materially for what's happening with current smartphones. I can tell you from a Qualcomm perspective, we do everything we can to pack more processing power in there and more functionality so they'll do more and more regularly so that we can sell more chips and everyone else can sell more devices and services with them. Um, but I think the life cycle for what I call like those slave devices, those will vary widely because I think some of those will become disposable probably to the point where I can buy them and maybe throw them away, my clothes when they're done or they'll just wear out or they will break. So you're really saying it's going, to, it's going to be related to the, device, the type of device it's tied to? I think so. Okay. Yeah. I think there's Chris? another thing I'd say on that. I mean, obviously it has a lot to do with, I mean, what's happened with these, the ecosystems out here and the fact that, you know, your phone, you know, with, with, whether it's on an iOS operating system or an Android, the fact that that phone can continuously be updated and made more current and made more relevant, you know, because the new operating system has come out, has actually changed the dynamic of, of you know, the need for a new device uh, a little bit uh, because your, your device is always current and always fresh with, you know, whereas in the past, you know, early on, I mean, you, you had to get a new phone in order to get the new capabilities. So, so we actually, ironically, we actually have seen a little bit of a slowdown in, in the upgrade cycles in the, in, really? the last, uh, in the last 12 months in, 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 the, in the phone space. And I, I think the other thing you're saying, too, is uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, also how much money you're putting into it. Uh, you know, the, the tablet replacement cycle, you know, isn't as aggressive, you know, as a, as a phone replacement cycle because you're, you're putting a lot more money into that tablet up front. And so, so I think uh, when you're making those investments, you want to make sure you're getting everything you can out of it. Yeah. So, I mean, this disaggregation of this device, I mean, see, I see this device as, as a, does a lot of different things for me, but from a physical standpoint, there's two major things about it. Oh, well, three. There's a big battery in it, there's a big radio in it, or a set of radios, and it's a terminal. So if you took the battery and the radio and you stuck it into another large object in your pocket, say, you know, one of these big keys that, so somebody showed me his key to his um, BMW, and the, and the thing was, you know, <laughs> the size of a stogie. Um, and um, so if you stuck your radio it, into you that, you can see what's on Bruce's like, mind right now. <laughs> But then, then you're going to say, well, what do you do with the displays? If you could disaggregate the displays to tablets, head mounts, or something like that, then, then this disappears. Because and it sells Qualcomm more chips, right? Because well, they have more but, devices and need more processors. But, but that's Brilliant. The, but, but, the, <laughs> but the point is, is, that, is then we, I mean, to, I'll put my green hat on here. And it's a little bit more sustainable. Yes, you want to sell more chips, but you don't want to sell, you don't want to sell more Gorilla Glass. Well, I mean... Yes, you make more money by selling the whole package, but if you're selling the chips, just replace the chips and put other chips in or put a module in. And so, I, um, and you're right. I don't see this going away, you know, in the next five years. Uh, maybe seven, eight years from now, this will disaggregate. But, but I, um, no, no, I, I agree wholeheartedly because I don't want to interact with it. Actually, you know, see they're reading something like this and... That's, that's not what I want to do, and, and my eyes are getting worse every year. Um, but whether it's a head mount or, or what I'd like this to do is to hook into the display, the most convenient display that I'm next to. Yeah. So, and I'm, 
okay, I'm a bit more high tech than, than the average person because of my job, I'm not away from a display very often, even if it's a public display. Well, John, I know you had a different take on these life cycles. Yeah, it's, uh, the automotive market is one of the, one of the most uh, difficult things about trying to bring consumer products into the vehicles. The vehicle life cycle is about 10 years. And if you can think back 10 years ago, where consumer electronics was at that time. I mean, there's no Facebook, no iPhone, nothing that, anything that we're talking about here was here 10 years ago. Yep. So if I'm working right now on radios, it'll be in cars in 14 and 15. Um, how do I even know what that's going to look like? I think the iPhone was at 16 times over from the iPhone 1 to iPhone 5 in five years. It's 16 times improved the performance. How do you account for that when you've got a product that's got to last for 10 years in the market? Well, how, how do you do that? Is there a way you can actually, you know, sell upgrades or, or just have well, the other? Well, we, I mean, um, software updates a big key. That's a relatively new thing in the automotive space to be able to upgrade your software in the head unit. It's happening now. Mm -hmm. But even in the cell phone market, even though you can update the software, the capability of the device has changed. You know, the sensors are different. The camera resolution is different. Um, the things you can do with it because of the hardware are different. So even though you can upgrade the software, that doesn't mean you can automatically stay current with so, what's so, out there. So are you saying that maybe what we'll see is not just, you know, over-the-air updates of the software for cars, but also, you know, stuff where you can come in and, and from, the, from the dealer and get uh, a new head, a new, uh, a new interface? I, I do think there'll need to be some, some kind of a way to bring in aftermarket devices safely into the vehicle will be part of the solution in some way, whether it's built in or whether it's nomadic where your cell phone is somehow connected to the vehicle in a smart way. Mm -hmm. These interfaces that allow for that are going to be critical. Um, so, so we're actually going to see these interfaces be a driving thing for hardware change there and it's going to be the CAN bus and everything else in the cars. This, this really sounds like a billion dollar industry to me uh, it, it's, that it's, you can have the interface drive what's going on. In the exactly. Cars. There's a, it's, it's fertile ground right now, definitely. Wow. Okay. So, so all you out there who are looking to do a startup. <laughs> We have an innovation center just across the street. <laughs> Go talk to John. He's here all day. Uh, he's taking cards now. Um, well, one of the, I'm going to pick on John here because you told me, uh, I'm going to switch topics on you, but you told me this really great anecdote about um, uh, an Android app one mm -hmm. of your friends wrote. Could you, could you re recall that? Yeah, there were, I have a, a buddy who's slowly losing his hearing, and uh, it's, it's bad enough that he needs a hearing aid, but he's not got one yet. And uh, I can have a phone call with him all day long, it's fine, but when I talk to him in person, it's hard to communicate. And uh, so we looked online, there's some apps, we downloaded an app for a cell phone that lets you use your cell phone sort of like a hearing aid. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't exactly what he needed, and so uh, I went and did a little looking at the Google APIs, and, and over one weekend, basically, I wrote an app for him that, um, just literally a couple pages of code, it was, and I'm not in the business of, of doing that, it was easy. So, this is not a paid endorsement, by the way. No. So anyway, he, uh, he uses that. And he, the thing that wasn't in the app that was online was uh, the mute, because there's some audio delay in the processing. And uh, when he spoke, it was really annoying that he hears his own voice. So you need a way to quickly mute the sound so while you're talking. Um, so that was literally less than a couple pages of code in a weekend, and it's, it's up and running. So but as doing that, it hit me. I mean, these are smartphones, they have speakerphone mode, they've got noise cancellation, they've got all kinds of high-end technology built in them. And if I'd taken it further, you could build a, your hearing aid test into there, you could create a custom frequency curve to match their needs. Um, if you built a device that was aware of the specific needs of that, you could really go a long way to solving that problem for a lot of people who are going to be having that problem more as this generation ages. Right. So I feel this personally, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things I think that John is really uh, uh, hitting on here is that, you know, we have an aging population, um, and uh, people are going to need these uh, these helps. Yep. And a lot of the sensors and manipulators on cell phones are already a good uh, a good. Um, it's mostly there. Right. And the um, uh, 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 and I think we're going to actually see these sort of accessibility things also be used for people who are mobile because. When people are mobile, they actually have less visual acuity. They have less, 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 less dexterity. Um, a quick thing before we switch to audience uh, questions, I want to have Blair talk uh, a little bit about the difference between mixed and augmented reality, um, uh, what that means, because I think that might prompt some questions from the audience. And then uh, we'll have people come up and, whoa, 
and I'm going to fall off my chicken stool. Uh, people come up and ask questions of the committee. But so first, mixed versus augmented reality, what's the difference? Yeah, so this comes up just in terms of people, uh, their expectations, what people understanding what they're talking about when they're talking about these different technologies. So in, in the academic world, really, we, we think about mixed reality as kind of anything that mixes information about the world around you with, with uh, uh, or the virtual world with, with the world around you. So Google Maps, when you do a local search, is, is mixed reality. It's mixing reality with the, the physical device. Um, I think there's something uniquely interesting uh, and, and a unique capability when you can actually register or put virtual information in the world. So I could put a bunch of information up here, a bunch of information on my phone about all of you, but uh, if I can have that information located near you when I look around, um, that's what I would call augmented reality because now we're really augmenting our perception directly of the world around us. Um, it's not necessarily, it, for many of the things we imagine, uh, uh, using uh, uh, location-based or context-aware technology. It's not really necessary to do that, even though people fantasize about the, the films and videos that they see. Um, but there are instances where the ability to put stuff out in the world, whether it's practical stuff like maintenance of, of equipment or, or even uh, things like augmenting historic sites, uh, it does become necessary. And I think it's worth differentiating those two because it helps people uh, understand the capabilities and focus on what you want to do, not just what the technology is. Okay. So you would say that the things I'm doing right now, having the clock up here and having the questions, that's mixed reality. Right, right. Whereas if I looked at each of you and had your, your, your name yeah. tags there, that'd be ugly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So let's switch to questions from the audience. Oops. Okay, I got one stuck up behind me here. So. I love it. I'll get to ask the first question. Yep. Get to so, so name and affiliation, please. Uh, well, uh, And I want to talk, uh, I want to ask about two phenomena that I've noticed in understanding people's experience with these technologies and ask the gentleman on this panel to react to what that means in terms of the design of future versions of these technologies. So the first is when I've worked in the healthcare space, I've noticed that people react to these little bricks as that they are very personal devices. Um, in the sense it's kind of frightening that they will react if they're using a desktop or a laptop and entering in health information, that there's an understanding of how that might be public or how that other people might have access to it. But when you get down to this little device, suddenly it's just them. And even though it's still connected to the cloud and it's still connected to the web, it's like this is me, that they're literally starting to connect with the device, that this is part of me. And there's just assumptions about privacy and assumptions about their interaction with the device that is really built into that, to that particular form factor. So that's one thing I want you to react to. The other so, one... So let me see if I get this right. So you, you want to see... So, so what's the question here? How, how has the size of the device changed? How is the size of the device in, personal? influence the fact that people think of these things as just a continuation of their own body um, okay. and their own... And, their, and kind of everything about that. And is there any particular person you want to direct that to? Uh, well, Chris could, could tackle that. He's okay, well, that. That, well okay. Chris, that's what was your second question. Okay, so the second question is another, there's a new way to change this perception, and this actually gets into the things that you were talking about with, with mixed and augmented reality. So the second thing that I've seen that's really exciting is when people start to see through the device to the outside world, mm -hmm. so when it starts to augment the world, now they start to get out of their bubble, their bubble of me, and they start to interact with, okay, there's this thing out here, and if, if I know that I'm seeing it in a way that you're seeing it in an interesting augmented way, mm -hmm. suddenly the interaction comes out of the device and it comes out into the world. And I think that's socially very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, the question is, are we designing a world where people will be more and more in their own bubble? Um, or are we designing a world that when we start to break apart the brick, sorry, Chris, um, but when we start to break apart the brick, and we start to augment the world with all of these devices and in the clothing, are we actually going to start to change people's perception of mm -hmm. the information and how they're interacting with each other? Because I think we've actually gone to, in some sense, sometimes a scary place okay. in the bubble of me. So, we'll, so we'll, we'll put that as the, you know, people's own virtual worlds are going to hit people more isolated, yeah. or are we actually going to uh, uh, create these augmented mixed realities so that it's more inclusive? And I'll direct that one to Bruce first. But first, let's go to, to Chris. Okay. Well, uh, so actually, uh, the question is very interesting because we, literally just this past week, we had we had a healthcare company come in uh, and sit down and talk with us, and 
and it was all about the ability to actually get your personal health record onto your device. Uh, and, and the key, though, was then your ability as the person to then share that record then with your caregiver. And, uh, and so, you know, you've seen a lot about the health changes and, and, the, and the masses, you know, getting a bunch of information together, you know, but, but we really do believe the consumer ultimately is probably, is, is going to drive this. And if, if you can actually control your own health record and you've got your information and you choose, you know, who you want to share that with and when you want to share it, then it, and it still allows you to keep that, that control, you know, over that very private information. And so, so I, I think it is going to be, you know, it's very important that people understand, you know, the role they play in, in management of, <laughs> of their information. I, you know, I'll be candid, I, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at what people are willing to put out there <laughs> uh, about themselves. Themselves on the on the internet today, uh, and and that seems to be a generational thing. That you know, the younger you are, the more it seems like it's okay. But but you know, I think that people you know have to you know when it comes down to things that are very very important that you do keep private and controlled, like healthcare records. That that is something where I think we're going to have to ensure that the consumer always has the ability to control the dissemination of that information to to whomever they want to go to. Anybody else on that, you know, the, personal, the personalization thing about the phone, or should we go on to the... All right, let's go on to... I'm going to direct us on the Bruce first because of uh, 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 the AR, uh, MR thing. Okay. So are we, are we talking people who are more isolated, or are we actually going to be more inclusive social with this? I, I'll, make, I'll do three examples. One example was somebody told me about a mail reader where what happened was is you turned on the phone so you could actually see where you were stepping while you were reading your mail. So that's what I, <laughs> that's what I thought about when you said that. No, but that, that, the second thing is, is I think what you're going to find with uh, a big area for the ARs and the games and entertainment, and I think those are most fun when they're socially played among a number of people. So I just think it's going to be in the same way that the I toy was, was not about you waving your hands in front of the uh, cameras, about you watching your family wave their hands in front. So it was a fam they did it as a family game. And I, and I, so I, FaceTime, all that sort of stuff from Apple, all these, these you know, Google Hangouts, you think it's going to be a lot well, that's the That's the third one that I was going to say. No, but actually, no, co-located. We're going to play this game in one place. But, but wow. I think there's going to be this interesting thing with augmented reality and, and, and all these social media is the fact is, okay, I'm traveling and I'm, you know, I saw an interesting thing and I wanted to share it with my wife and it happened to be a time that I could talk to her. It would be nice that I could actually share it with her in real time and not go back to my uh, hotel room and have a Skype meeting with her. And, but it would be nice that oh God, I saw this beautiful church and you should be here with me. And we could, you know, we could, we could virtually be tourists together. And so I think AR allows us to do that. And so, and I, and I, and I, that's, that's my hope for it because, because, you know, it does, look, I have a teenage son and he, you know, he studies, goes to school, does a lot of sports, and then is on the computer playing games. <laughs> and I really want to bust that habit of him saying entertainment is for me to sit in the corner hunched over with bad posture, staring at a computer playing a game. Because, you know. Work for me. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> oh, oh. Thanks, Bruce. Ouch. Love you, too. <laughs> no, it's, 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 I just think it's, you know, <laughs> that's a, my, my one demon about the technology. And it is for me. I mean, I started playing Half-Life, and I, you know, I played six hours, and I had this sore neck and eyes that were burning and stuff yeah. like this. And I can't believe I wasted, well, used six hours of my life to play this game. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll say one thing that, that happened uh, uh, when, so a lot of you probably have seen the Google I.O. demonstration of glass, where they had four skydivers jump out of a blip, blimp on, uh, over San Francisco and land on a conference center. And um, uh, when they were practicing for that, um, you know, they're doing Google Hangouts. And so Google Hangouts allows you to share the video of, in this case, of what you're looking at uh, with other people. Um, but you can also do normal, have normal people using Hangouts and, and uh, just like a normal conference system. And the, uh, the Sky team um, were the people who normally do stuff for GoPro. And they're used to jumping out of airplanes and blimps and all sorts of crazy stuff with cameras on their heads. But what got them so excited was actually seeing us back at the lab getting excited about their jump. 
right? Because they could see us back there waving. I think one of our team members had a big sign that said, jump, jump. <laughs> right? um, and the, the, this team, which has kind of gotten jaded about this stuff, got excited again because they're, they're falling through the sky 150 miles per hour. And what was cool about that, cool about them was seeing our reaction to them falling 150 miles per hour. So I, I think some of that's the in the moment sharing. Uh, Blair, did you want to add to this? Yeah, so space? ironically, I just had a uh, PhD student uh, submit her dissertation on Monday, <laughs> yesterday. Um, uh, and her whole dissertation was on co-located social play, right? And, and there is something uniquely different with augmented reality when uh, there's a group of people who, who are really convinced that they're seeing the same virtual content in the room. Right? There's been a ton of studies of Nintendo DSs and other kinds of gaming handhelds where uh, one paper was titled Playing Alone Together or something like that, right? where people see a group of kids sitting around and they've all hunched over their DSs, right? a group of people at a bar sitting there, music, everything, everybody's hunched over their phones because of this inability to bring the devices into the world. And, and when you push the content out into the world when it's possible, people, uh, you start getting these experiences like card games, board games, and so on, where you know when you play poker, most of the game is really about watching friends, bluffing, having that social experience. And you can start creating game experiences, and then eventually other more serious applications, right? So could you imagine using this phone for emergency response, where I open up a big map, and everybody's looking through their phone at the map, and we can gesture and point and talk about things without having to go, so do you see it on my phone here? And, and I think if we ever get to the point where we can have augmented reality glasses, um, which well, how about projection systems? Why not just you have a bar and so have a projection system that can you actually... could, if the situation's correct, and that goes to kind of what a bunch of us have talked about with uh, the right device at the right time. But you know, if I've set up a table out in out in you know the field out here because it's an emergency situation, and we we can unroll a map pretty easily, setting up a projector and so on might be untenable, right? Yeah. Or on a construction site, yeah. or in. Uh, repair situation, like if, if we need to repair some technology down here. Yeah. So I think it's a mix, right? Yeah. Projection's great because everybody sees exactly the right thing if it works at the yeah. time. Okay, so uh, do we have, please, uh, name affiliation and... Uh, Renu Kulkarni with Georgia Tech. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, my question and appeal stems from my years at Motorola where I was, um, well, when the two Motorolas were one company. And during that time, during the heyday, we actually used to have a head of digital design diva. And it was looking specifically at what kinds of devices and enablements appeal to women. And we actually came up with an index of some 30 different characteristics of the kinds of things that women need, which is presumably half of the population when they're using any sort of device. And things like, how do you quickly find your cell phone in your purse? Uh, we don't always wear belts, with all due respect. Um, and, oh, idea. <laughs> <laughs> and embedding um, an NFC reader, for example, in a lipstick case holder. Um, so my question and appeal is, have particularly the industry folks on the panel, uh, gentlemen on the panel, thought about what sorts of um, needs and innovations might appeal to the other half? Uh, any anybody in particular you want to direct that to? Oh, we lost it. <laughs> to the three. To the three, okay. And I'll, and I'll add to that. Um, my wife is, is always pestering me about making a smartphone for girls, for girl pockets, right? The new phones are getting bigger and bigger, and they just fall out of the pockets, right? So, okay, who wants to take this one first for our industry folks? Um, I'll take it, yeah. Um, you know, Qualcomm has traditionally provided sort of low-level technologies. Uh, we're doing more high-level things, but it's predominantly been chips. So we tend to look at use cases, um, a lot of different use cases, but I wouldn't say we spend as much time as we could um, looking at, um, at various demographics across those use cases, male, female. Different. Well, obviously, we've got a problem here. All of us are yeah. male, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I hear you loud and clear. We should spend more time um, doing that. Well, Chris, you have... Yeah, so I, I'd say that we, uh, we definitely, we partner up across all the different you know, manufacturers across you know, the planet you know, as far as all the different phone manufacturers. And, and we do try to make sure that as we're bringing in uh, devices, we are, we are definitely looking at, you know, who is that going to be targeted after and, you know, who is the likelihood to buy those, those particular devices. 
Uh, in fact, you know, a good example of this is, uh, you know, we're actually working on a project, you know, which is called, uh, you know, it's a uh, mobile personal emergency response uh, uh, system. And today, if you look at what those look like today, they're, they're big, clunky items that you, you push the button if you if you fall down type of scenario. But we actually had you know, a female panel the other day, you know, specifically talking about, you know, when I walk out to my car um, and it's not, it's at nighttime, you know, I'd like to have you know something that is you know, not huge, but you know, could be easily accessible. That I can push that button to alert people if I if I feel like I might be in trouble. And and, and so and, and that's a different form factor than being you know, a big thing you're going to wear around your neck, right? So so I, so I would say that um, you know we're we're constantly trying to make sure that we're we're looking across all all of the segments and and, and their needs, both both from a, a demographic you know aging as well as as well as different uh, you know. Uh, I'd say, you know, women, men, children, you know, uh, uh, what, what do we need to do to make sure that we're providing those devices in that, that really will meet the needs? And, and I think it's just something we've got to continuously look through uh, the lens of, of, of everybody and not just, uh, not just the people that are you know, sitting here on the panel or the people that are designing the products. Yeah, one of the things that, that I always have been saying is that, look, fashion is, is really important because if people aren't willing to put it on, Absolutely. you've lost right there. I'm, I'm, before we go to the next question, I, I really like to ask John, so how has this come up in the automotive industry? I was just thinking through, I, I'm not, I know that they have certain car brands that are advertised to, you know, different groups of people that have different features, but How about I, I interaction think, in as I'm car? thinking about it, I think you're right. I think there's probably not, in my, my experience, not enough attention in that area. Okay. I did see report recently, I can't remember where, about that there's more female users of mobile technology than male users. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other statistics that say the primary buyer or decision maker of many of most purchases are women. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've seen that. And so today's, today's also, news yeah. is that there are more licensed, female licensed yeah. drivers in New York. Hey, there you go. You so, can use that to help ch make, make change. Yeah. I, think, I can't speak much to the specific needs, obviously, but uh, I think there's a definite need for more attention in that area. So obviously you need to, you know, get, you know, Beth and hire some HCI people, right? Helena, oh, would you like to? Hi, my name is Helena Mitchell. I'm here at Georgia Tech. Good presentation, guys, and I love all my mobile devices, my smartphones, the tablets, and everything. But I have spent a lot of my career working in the field of emergency communications and looking at wireless and how mobile devices interface. So my question has to do with battery life. What are your projections on all these devices which only have a battery life, if you're lucky, of a day? And when are we going to solve those problems so these devices that are so smart will be able to really help us in emergencies? Oh, here we go. Who wants to take that one on? <laughs> I, think, I think that one, I'm going to put that one to Jay. <laughs> It's really been an interesting phenomenon as we've gone from feature phones to, uh, to smartphones. I mean, you guys probably remember, it wasn't too long ago that you'd look at like standby times, like they were in weeks, yep. and talk times that were in days, right? And now we're all okay buying phones that literally barely get you through the day. So um, it's really weird, kind of strange that, that that's gone down that way. But, um, you know, I, I think the challenge is people demand more and more processing power for the kinds of things that they want to do, and it's worth the hit that they take in, in battery power. And unfortunately, we can't change the laws of, of physics here, and battery technology doesn't move as fast as other technologies have moved. So you know, I think we're going to be in this boat for some time to come. As long as you still like to watch video, you like high bandwidth on your phone, you want to do those kind of things, um, it's, it's going to, t and you, you know, you don't want to carry around a, a giant battery or small nuclear reactor. Um, I tried that once. They wouldn't give it to you? me. It but seriously, I, I, really, I really did try to do it. He actually did. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. It turns out you can get something, the, the, the smallest one you can get is about that big. Yeah. It's one of the thermopiles, um, plutonium, and you know, you have to get a license from the Department of Energy. <laughs> it costs about a thousand dollars, but it lasts for 82 years. I mean. So but the, the emergency services thing, you know, with, with Hurricane Sandy, I saw some photos where there were people, I mean, I saw like a table, it was a picture taken somewhere in Manhattan, and there's a table of all these devices and cables and somebody cranking something. Yep. And there's clearly an issue when power goes out and people can't charge their phones. So I think there's probably an opportunity to do something for emergency services that gives people some kind of shared power station or something 
so that they can get phones back up and running when, um, when the power goes out. And maybe that's the way that that problem gets addressed. I'm, I'm going to be annoying here and take some of this, because this, this is one of the things I teach. Right? I, I, whenever I'm going off to Samsung or to a, a company like Google, the first things I say is, you know, everything else is going to change in the 18-month development cycle except for your battery. Yeah. Choose the biggest battery your industrial designers can possibly deal with, right? And then design everything else. Um, and as far as the, the power thing, you know, the, the hand crank. There's a company now that's using something called reverse electro wetting. And oh. their idea is to put a power generator in your shoe and the footfalls actually generate power. And they're talking like 20 watts. And that, that powers a, 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 a Wi-Fi hotspot that connects to the cellular infrastructure in your shoe. There That's you cool. Right? Are you wearing one? No, I'm not wearing one. <laughs> I mean, the, we tried to make one, I tried to make one a while back, and you know, the best you could get was like a watt or so. Okay. Um, but these guys got this new physical process. Um, so I can imagine now in the future that the, the people who actually have the best connectivity are the knee bouncers. <laughs> but not, a yeah. question, not a question, but a comment. But that technology might solve the adolescent obesity problem in this country. <laughs> yeah. but, there we go. So the question I wonder about with that is I mean, could you charge just a battery with a USB port in the back of your shoe, right? So you get the, the whole get smart thing, holding the shoe well, up to your. So for me, I, I carry around a, a phone, a, a battery case that yeah. when my phone dies, I, I just shove it in, yeah. uh, or at events where I'm, I'm doing media all day. but. You know, if you could basically, as you're walking, be charging up two auxiliary batteries in your shoe yeah. that you can plug into. But there's I just don't there's, know there's the, no reason to do it. The big problem is mechanical wear. And so the, what would you do instead? You do a PVDF, a, a piezo stave in there, and that charges up the battery. And you're not as efficient, but that stuff can take a beating. So we have to look at the female shoe uh, version of that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, yes. Uh, but, 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 but uh, the female shoe is great because you've got some nice dynamics <laughs> there, right? But, I, one thing I do think that kind of helps uh, a little bit in the interim is, is you know, kind of the, the wireless charging capabilities uh, that are really becoming more and more prevalent out there so that you don't have to have the plug-in and the mats, you know, that are, that are coming out there. So, you know, Ultimately, you want to be in a position where you can be charging as often as possible. So you know because it's just easy to do, and you're not having to search for you know do I have the right plug in order in order to be able to do it. And um, and we've talked and actually John and I were talking the other day about you know you know when you get in your car, where do you normally put your phone? And, you, know, you, you might keep it in your purse or you might throw it in the cup holder. Uh, but wouldn't it be nice if the cup holder was actually just you know uh, was a power mat inside there that was you know, was charging it? So so where, how do you make it yeah. easy and how do you make it more pervasive where there's more and more wireless? capabilities to be charging, you know, I think that's another place where that, we can kind of get that's, the That's one of the things, you know, if you make it part of people's daily lives, like I love the cup, cup holder thing, because yeah. um, you imagine throwing your keys in there or whatever else. The other thing is your, your dresser at night, right? If you're going to have these distributed devices, you imagine just taking them off at night, putting them on your dresser, and then the dresser surface is this inductive charger and it charges all the devices, mm -hmm. right? Chris, you have a comment? Oh, just, uh, just a quick comment. I've been, one of the other projects we work on was wireless sensor networks, and if you pare your radio needs down really small, I mean, you can get a radio that lasts a very, very long time. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, so in, to, in response to the, the question is, um, I think sometimes we over-feature things, yeah. That's true. and then it just sucks all the power yeah. out of it. Yeah. Uh, my, my wife yeah. still uses an old Nokia phone that has a little <laughs> tiny display on it. Yeah. And, you know, she charges it up once a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, back to the, those yeah. old yeah. times. Yeah. So we've got another question here. Uh, Mark Ronstein, Georgia Tech. So it strikes me that uh, back in the late 70s, I attended a healthcare conference uh, and saw the Xerox uh, Star computer, which featured icons on a desktop. And if I look at the latest and greatest smartphones, I see icons on a desktop. Well, I guess Microsoft's really innovating some with that in, in Windows 8. Are we ever going to move beyond this paradigm? And what do you think the new paradigm might be? Oh, my. I think a um, oh. couple things. One is uh, I'm looking forward to when the reflective, non-emissive you know, type displays are commonplace. And then your whole phone is a display. The back, the sides, everything. It's all like paper display. It changes. It can match your clothes. Or maybe that might be one of the functions there. But um, everything, every surface is dynamically adjustable and, and doesn't emit, you know, that light as part of its native mm -hmm. uh, feature. Yeah. So, well, I, 
I was going to say I can make the obvious joke that with augmented reality, we're just going to put icons on your desktop. Um, <laughs> with, the, uh, the, with fiducials. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, I mean, the big thing for, for abstract information, you need to rep represent it and it gets efficiently represented iconically, right? So even on the videos for glass, there's a lot of icons on this little thing. Um, I think one of the big problems with mobile phones right now is the sort of one app at a time uh, setup. Uh, which prevents a lot of the kind of behaviors we're used to, right? How many people tried uh, or fantasized about switching to an iPad for their mobile computer from a laptop and realized when they did that it's like, oh, wow, if I can only have one app at a time, it totally ruins my work style, right? The, the, the lots of information, lots of, of things going on at once. Um, so the small screens have a, have a disadvantage there. You know, Windows 8 shows you don't need the, the normal desktop WIMP, WIMP structure uh, to, to be effective, but I think this mix of abstract information combined with things like documents and all that other stuff requires some sort of representation, even if it's not doc icons. Yeah, just a quick comment. I, I can't tell you what's going to come after icons, but there will be some changes in just user interaction that will come with certainty. And, and there's been, you've probably seen in the last year or two, that voice has come a long way for Siri and then for other voice control. It won't be too long before you're able to just talk to your phone and your phone is always listening, whether that screen is on or not, just when it's sitting on the table. Okay, Glass, take a picture. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, you know, I'm asking for when's my next appointment or things like that. But voice interaction come, has come a long way. It's getting to the point that'll happen and we're getting power consumption down for the microphone and audio listening such that that'll be a very low power state and your device can be listening all the time, which you can't, can't do today. So that'll happen. And then there's also a lot happening on front-facing cameras with uh, gestures and things. So you might be able to do some interactions with your device by you know, facial hand gestures in, in front of it. But, but I think, in my mind, it's the, it's the location context. So, you're, so your computer will do things because it knows where you're standing and who you're talking to. Um, the thing that intrigued me most about the AT&T talk last night was the fact is, is you're driving and your, your calendar gets changed because it knows where you are and how long it's going to take you to get to the meeting. So, so, so these things are all plugged in. And so, so now you don't have to go and change your calendar. I mean, I would like my calendar to at least know that we're a multi-campus university. When somebody puts two appointments in my calendar, they're on different campuses, <laughs> and it takes a half an hour to get to the campus. So, um, so actually, the whole concept of saying there's travel time associated with your appointment. So, and this so you're, you're, really, you're really pushing the context awareness stuff. So it's not just the icon stuff, but it's actually, you know, um, you know, putting stuff information in its place in the right. real world, but also understanding the context of the user. Uh, and the physicality of the user, so that it's part of the interface. So, so, so instead, well. instead of you in initiate, you're still controlling the computer, but instead of you initiating everything, the the computer is like anticipating what you might need next. So really, it's about the we're talking about the computer getting real, right? Everything has been stuck in these vir in these boxes in this virtual worlds, and now we're actually talking about interacting with the physical world and the physical body, you know, through gesture, through speech. Um, That's right. And I think, you know, again, going back to the AT&T talk yesterday, the, 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 asset, the, the important part is that everything's connected, right? Because you can't, all these small vignettes of it, it senses this or I have voice input for that, if it, if it doesn't interact with the rest of my right. workflow, um, then it becomes too much of a burden or you, you just can't use it, right? So once yeah. you can, can have all these things integrated, yeah, I can do email when I need to do email. I can create an Excel spreadsheet when I need to create an Excel spreadsheet. Excel spreadsheet, but I, if I can bring all this other stuff to bear at the same time, I can lessen the amount of time I spend doing desktopy things and the amount of and, and do the other kinds of activities in their natural sort of and place. That's, yeah. And that's one of the things that I really thought was uh, nice about the you know uh, project lab. Talk about project last for a second. The project last concept video. It wasn't that, like each of those things was not something you can't do in your cell phone now. There's more the integration of it Absolutely. and a seamless. Right. Uh, application of that to your life and to your lifestyle, I thought was so compelling about that that particular video. You were going to say something, John? Yeah, in the automotive space, I think one thing that's beginning to happen is instead of having the icons for launching individual activities, activities can be augmented by additional functionality. Like in your navigation, if your activity is navigating, 
Um, you can imagine extending it in specific ways with add-on functionality that comes later. But it's not like a separate app that you launch. It's just now that application, that activity is augmented by these extra features. Yep. So it doesn't show up like a separate app, but it's added into the system. Unfortunately, I've just been told we're out of time. Maybe we can talk, uh, uh, talk afterwards. But uh, if we could thank our panel. Thank you guys very much. Mm -hmm.